John Wesley was the founder of the Methodist Church, and in his life he rode 250,000 miles on horseback. And after preaching two or three sermons a day, by the end of his life he had preached 40,000 sermons. And just to give you some context, if, if I preach at the rate that I'm at, by the time I retire, assuming I ever retire, I'll, I'll hit somewhere around 4,000 sermons. So that dude, he talked a lot. All the time. The Methodist movement, what becomes the Methodist Church, was built on small groups gathering to hold each other accountable once a week and preaching. Lots and lots of preaching. First by John Wesley and then by those who he trained. And preaching over the course of time, John Wesley preached for 60 years. And he preached across uh, the Isle of, of Britain. And Britain, anyone here visited Britain? Yeah, how far, how long does it take to drive across Britain? A couple hours, right? Yeah, either way. And you could fit Britain into Missouri at least once over, right? If not twice. And so after preaching for 60 years across a fairly small geographic area, he saw a lot of people multiple times. And he was able to see people come to follow Jesus and, and light on fire and, and burn the light of faith the rest of their lives. And he, sometimes he saw people who uh, started following Jesus and then faded. And this is a sermon in response to that phenomena. He uh, writes this sermon, if you ever want to read the original, it's uh, number 79 on dissipation. And he writes in response to this challenge of people fading. And if this sermon has a slightly different uh, cadence or, and tone than usual, it's because this sermon is reworked from uh, 300 years ago. So some of the old language comes shining through. So these are his thoughts on a single verse off of 1 Corinthians 7.35 on the importance of attending upon the Lord without distraction, without dissipation. There is always the risk of dissipation of a faith once vibrant can fade, can lapse as the pressures of life take their toll, as people become distracted, whether it be from well-intentioned busyness or self-absorbed focus looking to one's own satisfaction above the others. Either way, it can happen. And what it appears like specifically, Wesley lists some of them. He says it can be the hurry of busyness, the seeking of on honor, or it can be a fondness for diversions, a focus on silly pleasures and trifles. Isn't that a great word? On the trifles of life. On the focus on the vulgarity of life, being overly serious about worldly employment, or getting lost in the temptation to cards and drink. Either way, it leads to dissipation, for it is leading away from God being at the center of how we think through things, how we judge things. And, and this is, you often see people will list, like, what's most important in life? Be like God, uh, family, job, something like that. Th that's not quite what it, we're getting at here. It's not like a listing of what was the order of who's in charge. It's more a sense of who gets to call the shots when it comes to the, question, the decisions that matter. And to dissipation, what it looks like is, I go to church on Sunday, and then I go make a business decision. And you ever hear the phrase, it's just business? Yeah, it's just business, right? That's just business. How much I pay someone, or, or what, how I treat my customers, or how I treat other employees, you know, that, that's just business. No. That is how we treat another child of God. Right? It also, dissipation shows up when, when, thank God, we're done with it for a while. Politics, right? We hear the, those, these attack ads, and that's, you know, that's just how politics works, attack ads. No. That is an attack upon a fellow child of God, your neighbor who you are called to love, even if you disagree with them politically, and you probably do. Right? Dissipation, is when it comes to family, it's... Um, you know, I know Jesus calls me to be an ambassador of reconciliation, but have you met my Aunt Martha? <laughs> 
I don't actually have an Aunt Martha, but you get the point, right? And yes, Jesus loves your Aunt Martha too, right? It, dissipation is saying, I will worship Jesus on Sunday, but then allow Jesus not to have the last call when it comes to how I practice my business, practice my politics, treat my family. Dissipation, it, it's dangerous because it doesn't look like someone saying, that's it, I have had it, I'm done with church, I wash my hands of Jesus. It is someone coming to church regularly, but it doesn't matter to the other thing. So that's dissipation, right? Dissipation, it can appear detestable when people make what we would now call poor life decisions, or it can appear honorable. You know, they're, he's just really committed to his job. She really just works really hard. Either way, it can come to the same thing, a distraction, a dissipation, a, a, away from um, a focus on what is Jesus's desires in, in the situations of our life. Now, it is amusing to read when Wesley describes his culture in the 17th century England as as bad as it could be. He, he roots it in uh, the, the reign of King Charles II. He was the beginning of this, this trend towards dissipation and not people not paying attention to, to Jesus in their lives. I will risk disagreeing with Wesley to, to, to say that... Um, I think dissipation has been an issue for far longer than just a king in England, and I believe it it's probably wasn't as bad as it could possibly be back then because Wesley never had to deal with smartphones. <laughs> think about what a smartphone does. A smartphone can reinforce the worst in us in that, it, well, in many ways, like how many ways can you distract and amuse yourselves on a smartphone? How many ways can business and work suck you back in on a smartphone? Right? That's just an amazing example of uh, what technology, whether it's smartphones or laptops or TVs or, or whatever it is. And it is a challenge to resist this because we get addicted to our distractions. But to look at your phone, how many times do you look at your phone? You look at your phone, try counting one day. And... Um, Every time you look at your phone and someone pings you on Facebook or on Instagram or Slack or Discord or email or whatever your game of choice is, you, your brain releases a little burst of dopamine and you go, ooh. And, and we train ourselves to, to want that, ooh. Right? And so dissipation, it's just in our culture today that we get distracted so very easily from what matters most. And what matters most is the relationship we have to our Lord, that we follow Jesus. And because of following Jesus, the relationship we have to each other. We are meant to be in relationship with God and to each other. That's how we are created. That's, our, that, that's what we're meant to do. We are meant to attend upon the Lord without distraction. An example of this is the almost hackneyed example Wesley trots out of Mary and Martha, where Jesus comes over to see Mary and Martha, and you know how this goes. Martha is off, she's doing the dishes, and she's tidying, and she's making sure the curtains, and she's doing all of the things, and she goes over to Jesus, and won't you tell my sister Mary to get over here and help? And, and Jesus looks at her and says, chill. That's my translation. What he actually says is, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are necessary. Really, only one, and your sister has chosen it. So seriously, chill. Right? And I know how hard it is, because I had company over this week, and my wife and I have had to make a deal that uh, she won't obsess about having a perfectly clean house, and I won't obsess about putting a marvelous feast on. We will focus on what is essential, not so many other things. Right? And a time that values multitasking, to be like Martha is what is encouraged, to always be working, to always be available, to always just be busy. And Wesley points out that we would think that we would be past this, that once we decide to follow Jesus, that we should be good, and that, yes, that we should be. But the pressures of our, our culture, our time, are always there. As Jesus points out, we are tempted to rule like pagans do, to try to get our way by forcing others, that uh, instead to continue to... Remember that the greatest of all is a servant of all and, and is rooted in what Jesus would do. To yield to temptations is to let go of this and, and to become unhinged from God and God's desires and to end up desiring that which is temporary and perishing and unsatisfying, things that are of the world. 
Now, Wesley is famously blunt. Wesley, once he was invited to preach at the, he was a, a, a professor at what you might call a college or a seminary, Christ College, and uh, into this room full of uh, his colleagues, seminary professors, uh, people who teach pastors, teach people who are professed Christians. He, he preaches a sermon called On the Danger of a Half-Converted Clergy. And uh, can you imagine preaching that to a room full of preachers? I mean, he, he, he is just amazingly blunt. And he continues that here. He, he, he's preaching this across the, the British Isles, and he talks about how the British kingdom of the day was a dissipated nation. Like the whole nation, everyone, uh, the whole nation is dissipated and, and is fading away from a focus on, uh, on Jesus and how Jesus would, Jesus' desires for how to, we are to live. And I would dare say that that might be an accurate description today as well, just as it was in Wesley's day. 75 to 85% of Americans identify as Christians when asked. To be a Christian is to follow Jesus. Jesus asks people, follow me. An individual decision, always an individual decision, but it's then a team sport. It's a group activity to follow Jesus. Follow me becomes follow us. Jesus, people who follow Jesus always follow Jesus together. And, and so do we see 75% of Americans in church this morning? No, about 25%. If you do the math, if we live in a community of just over 2,000 people, including some rural sections, if you do the add up, Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, you get about 500 people in worship, and that's about one quarter of the population. So do we live in a dissipated nation? Well, the numbers are the numbers. So how do we avoid this? How, how do we avoid this? It is only by the grace of God as a gift from God that we are able to stay focused and not fall into dissipation. <coughs> to do as is described in 1 Thessalonians, to rejoice always, to pray without ceasing, and everything to give thanks. This is God's plan for how we are to live, to continue steadfast in the faith, a faith that works by love, to stay in love with God, as, uh, to stay focused on God's hopes, in dreams and plans. Instead of focusing on what is unholy and impure, on the vices that tempt, to instead to let our minds dwell on whatever is true and honorable, right, pure, lovely, whatever is of good repute, of excellence, anything that is worthy of praise, as Paul writes in Philippians. Yes, we begin our Christian walk with repentance, turning away from sin and God, from sin and towards God. But, but that is the beginning, and to continue to keep this first love ignited and, and hot and, and, and shaping how we live, that, that is the, the response to dissipation. Now this is where Wesley leaves off, and Wesley preached two to three times a day at the same time, multiple, same place, multiple times, and I don't preach as much as he does, so I'm going to put one more thought at the end of this that I'm sure he would have gotten to if he'd preached for longer. I'm going to point to the, uh, there's a quote on the front of your bulletin. <coughs> and this is what that quote reads, it's by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Being a Christian is less about cautiously avoiding sin than about courageously and actively doing God's will. We get the sense at times, I believe, that church is a place for don'ts. Right? Come to church so we can figure out all the don'ts. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that. And if you don't do all these things, you know what you are. If you nail all the don'ts, if you, if you don't do all the bad things, you know what you are? Boring. Right? You're vanilla. Anyone here like vanilla ice cream? Yeah. Well, no one's perfect. Vanilla, you know what vanilla needs? It needs some chocolate. It needs two cherries. Why, why do you ever bother with one cherry? Put two cherries on top. It needs some caramel, some butterscotch. It needs something going on, right? That, that's, that's what church is. Church is not a place to gather and be vanilla. Unless that's what you want, then. But... <laughs> It's not a place to gather and be vanilla and focus on the don'ts. It's a place to get wrapped up in all the things that we can do. It's the things for us. It's not don'ts. It's here, what can we do to follow Jesus actively and passionately. It is to be shaped to be artists. Have you ever met an artist who said, that's it, I'm done, I'm as good as I need to be? 
Like a musician, that's it. I can sing as high as I, I'm good, right? Or, or uh, someone who writes, and I, I've written the perfect book, I'm done, no more, right? You never meet a craftsman who is done improving how he or she can work with leather or, or, or work with metal and knife. Like, we never find that. And why do artists and craftsmen keep on seeking to improve? Why? It's not because they're going to get paid more for it. You know how much people get paid for a bad book versus a good book? About the same, right? You just get paid for a book. Why do people continue to strive? Because it's more beautiful. Right? You get caught up in the beauty. I, I, this is good, but man, if I could do this, wouldn't that be even better? Wouldn't that be more satisfying? Wouldn't that be more enjoyable to be so caught up in something? And that is what we are here to do today. We're not here to be vanilla and a bunch of don'ts. We are here to be artists of our lives. Right? We don't avoid dissipation by focusing all the things we don't do. We avoid dissipation by getting wrapped up in all the things we can do as we follow Jesus, as we seek to become more like Christ. Your life is your art, and how you live your art is everything, and you, you get to choose. Are you going to focus on the don'ts, or are you going to focus on the beauty of following Jesus Christ? such that you seek every day to become more like him. Not because you have to, but because it's gorgeous. Amen.